students, welcome to the lecture um, for chapter nine continued. Um, I'm going to be talking about a number of specific synovial joints and showing you uh, the anatomical models that we have in the classroom um, just to get a better feel for the three dimensionality of the structures that I'm going to be mentioning. Um, and the first joint that I'm going to be discussing is the tibiofemoral joint. Now, if you know your bones, which we just came out of gross anatomy of the skeleton, hopefully you will recognize these terms. Uh, so you can probably figure out which two bones are involved in this joint. You have the tibia for one. After forgive me, I'm recording this at school and I don't have my uh, tablet with me here. Um, tibia and then your femur. So you probably know what the common name for this joint is. This is the knee joint. Um, it is a synovial joint. A synovial joint is going to be the most complicated type of joint. Um, so it's, it's going to allow for a lot of movement and there are going to be a number of supporting structures at this joint as well. So this particular joint is often considered the most complicated of the synovial joints. And a few of the structures that um, are on your learning objectives, which normally this is paired with um, gross anatomy of the skeleton. So these would be um, terms that you'd study alongside the bones for the first lab practical. We have the patellar ligament, the lateral and medial collateral ligaments. Um, also, those are called the fibular and tibial collateral ligaments, respectively the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. Uh, you've probably heard the terms ACL and PCL. Uh, that's where those abbreviations come from. And then the lateral and medial menis menisci. So I'm going to be showing you some illustrations of this particular joint, and then I'm also going to be showing you the actual model that we use in the classroom. Okay, so looking at this um, from an anterior perspective, so this would be the front of the tibiofemoral joint, the knee joint. Uh, those structures that I just listed that are on your lab learning objectives, here we have the patellar ligament. And technically, remember that a ligament connects bone to bone. So this particular structure is connecting the patella with the tibia. And on the model, it basically shows this as one continuous structure that spans across the patella and grades into this tendon here. And remember that a tendon is going to connect bone to muscle. So this is technically the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle, which we'll be looking at in the next chapter. So our patellar ligament connects the patella to the tibia. And then we have our um, fibular collateral ligament that is connecting the femur to the fibula. And another term for that is LCL, lateral collateral ligament. If you recognize that the fibula is towards the outside of the body, that would be the lateral bone of the leg. Uh, the fibular collateral ligament spans from the fibula to the femur. And again, another term for that is lateral collateral ligament, which is often just abbreviated LCL. And on the other side, we have the tibial collateral ligament spanning from the tibia to the femur, um, and that's often abbreviated MCL for medial collateral ligament uh, because the tibia is the medial bone of the leg. So it's really just kind of personal preference. Um, usually in a clinical setting, um, MCL and LCL are more common. And then looking at this from the posterior with the joint capsule intact, um, you can see the tibial collateral ligament. Again, that would be the MCL and the fibular collateral ligament or LCL. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and show you um, the model that we use in the classroom for the knee joint. So this is the anterior view of this model here. And viewing it from the side, you kind of get a better idea of what you're looking at here. This is, of course, the patella. So this would be the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle. 
and then spanning from the patella to the tibia, that's going to be the patellar ligament. Um, looking at this bone right here, which bone is this? This is the fibula. So this structure right here is the um, lateral collateral ligament or fibular collateral ligament. And this structure right here, this is the medial collateral ligament or tibial collateral ligament. So this would be on uh, the inside of the, of the leg, um, closer to the midline of the body. Um, looking at it from the back here, we have the posterior cruciate ligament. Remember, it's always in relation to anatomical position. So this is towards the back of the tibiofemoral joint. So that's going to be your posterior cruciate ligament. And then your anterior cruciate ligament. Again, this, this can be kind of confusing, but you have to keep in mind that it's in relation to uh, the patient or um, anatomical position. So this would be the anterior cruciate ligament because it is closer to the front of this um, joint than the posterior cruciate ligament is. Um, so that is our knee joint model. Um, I almost forgot the menisci. Um, this is the lateral meniscus here. So that's going to be on the same side as the fibula. And then on the other side, this is the uh, medial menisci. So that's going to be on the same side as the tibia. All right, moving on to the glenohumeral joint. Now, again, some of these terms may look familiar to you. Gleno, think glenoid cavity of the scapula. Humeral, humerus. So this is going to be the shoulder joint. Structurally, this is considered the most unstable joint in the human body. Um, it is a ball and socket joint with the ball basically being the head of the humerus and the socket being the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Um, for the purposes of this course, um, I'd like you to be familiar with the following structures. The labrum, the coracohumeral ligament, the coracoacromial ligament, and the glenohumeral ligaments or joint capsule. And you'll want to know that the following contribute to the joint stability. These are the tendons of the rotator cuff muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Okay, looking again at the shoulder joint. Um, here, of course, we have the head of the humerus. This would be the glenoid cavity of the scapula, and this would be the acromion, which is continuous with the spine of the scapula. Uh, basically, what this is showing you are the tendon sheaths um, and other connective tissue supporting structures. Um, this is an anterior view of the right shoulder joint capsule. Um, showing the coracohumeral ligament and part of the glenohumeral ligaments. Okay, looking here at our model of the uh, shoulder joint here, this would be the subscapular fossa. So we're looking at it from the anterior at this um, angle here. This would be part of the glenohumeral uh, ligaments, part of the joint capsule. Uh, this ligament here that attaches the coracoid process to the acromion is going to be the coracoacromial ligament. Uh, the labrum, the glenoid labrum, is not really going to be easy to show, but basically if you were to remove the humerus, you'd be able to see <laughs> this connective tissue um, structure. Apologies for that. Your uh, sympathetic nervous system probably just kicked in there with the fight or flight response with that very loud noise. Um, the model just fell off of the base. Um, we have the glenoid labrum here, and we also have the uh, coracohumeral ligament. Okay, I think that is all of the structures that I wanted to show you on this model, so I'm going to be moving on to our next, our next joint here. All right, the humeral ulnar joint or the elbow joint. And again, think about what these terms mean. Humor, 
refers to the humerus, ulnar, of course, the ulna. So this is a joint that's a little bit more simple in terms of uh, movements allowed. This is a hinge joint rather than a ball and socket joint. So you're all aware, of course, that uh, the movement at your elbow is a little bit more restricted than, say, the movement at your knee or your shoulder joint. Um, you're not really going to have lateral movement with this. Uh, the radius does not contribute to this joint. Um, and I've mentioned this in class, but you should be familiar with these terms pronation and supination and the relationship between the radius and ulna to one another as well as to the um, humeral ulnar joint. Um, what this joint allows is basically flexion and extension. And flexion is a decreased angle at the joint. So imagine you're doing um, simple weightlifting, a biceps curl, for example. If you're actually lifting the weight and um, going from your elbow joint being extended to flexed, that would be flexion. So you're decreasing the angle at that joint. Extension would be when you go to set that weight down, for example. So you're increasing the angle at that joint. Um, there are a couple different structures that I'd like you to be able to identify. The annular ligament, the radial collateral ligament, and then the ulnar collateral ligament. So again, if you are familiar with the gross anatomy of the arm and the forearm, um, this should be fairly intuitive to you at this point. So various views of the elbow. Um, remember that the ulna is the forearm bone that actually forms the joint with the humerus. So this would be the ulna and then the radius. Uh, the annular ligament basically encapsulates the head of the radius here. Uh, the radial collateral ligament um, is shown right here. And then the ulnar collateral ligament, looking at a medial view. Uh, there are actually several different parts to that structure. Um, looking at a closer view of the lateral view of a right elbow joint, annular ligament again is going to be encircling the head of the radius. The radial collateral ligament is going to be here. And then the medial view, you'll be able to see that ulnar collateral ligament. All right, moving on to the coxal joint. This is also known as the hip joint. Um, again, this is a, another ball and socket joint. So the ball would be the head of the femur. The socket would be the acetabulum of the pelvic girdle. Structurally, this is a little bit more stable than the shoulder just because there's less movement permitted here. And generally speaking, the more movement that is allowed at a joint, the more unstable that joint is. So there's always going to be this trade-off between range of motion and stability. If a joint is less stable, it's also more prone to injury. Um, case in point, the shoulder joint and the knee joint, those are very prone to injury. Um, there is going to be a larger labrum and more ligament support with this joint. Um, some of those structures to identify, we have the labrum itself, the ligamentum teres, the iliofemoral ligament, the pubofemoral ligament, and the ischiofemoral ligament. Um, so this is a nice uh, lateral view of a partially dissected view of the, the interior of the hip joint. So this would be the head of the femur, for example. Um, one of the structures that you're not really going to see on our model is this uh, ligamentum teres here. Um, looking from the outside, we have a posterior view with the iliofemoral ligament. And again, break down these words to get an understanding of where these ligaments are going to be. Ilio refers to the ilium, which is the largest bone of the pelvic girdle, the most superior bone. Femoral is going to refer to the femur. So all this means is that there's going to be a ligament attaching the ilium to the femur, iliofemoral ligament. Looking at the anterior view, again, we see the iliofemoral ligament as well as the pubofemoral ligament. And again, it's, it's intuitive if you know the structures of the pelvic girdle. Um, this is going to inform you by its name that it's going to be a ligament that spans from the pubis to the femur. Uh, looking at a frontal section through the right hip joint, uh, you get a better sense 
of this connective tissue, the acetabular labrum, that's going to hold the head of the femur into the acetabulum there. And a posterior view, you're going to see the greater trochanter of the femur, the lesser trochanter of the femur, the ischium, which is that rounded, more posterior part of the pelvic girdle. Now you're going to see the iliofemoral ligament again, as well as the ischiofemoral ligament. All right, looking at the hip joint model here, we of course have the ilium, which is going to be the largest, most superior bone of the pelvic girdle. We're going to have this rounded ischium, and then we're going to have this more pointed pubis. So the, uh, the ligaments basically are named for what, bone, what bones they attach to. So the pubofemoral ligament is going to be this structure here that you can't see that. <laughs> this structure here that uh, spans from the pubis to the femur. The um, iliofemoral ligament is going to basically be this structure right here. So it's going basically from the anterior inferior iliac spine um, down uh, past the uh, trochanters here. And then the ischiofemoral ligament is going to connect the um, ischium to the femur. Okay, finally we have the temporomandibular joint or TMJ. Um, you may have heard this acronym before, TMJ, which often uh, is just referring to any sort of pathology or dysfunction that occurs at this joint. Um, temporomandibular, think about what two bones might be involved there. Temporal bone and the mandible. So this is the jaw joint. It is a modified hinge joint. Uh, so it's it's modified because it, it allows for a little bit more movement than say most strict hinge joints. So not only does it create elevation and depression, but it also creates some rotation of the jaw, which basically allows for chewing food. So a little bit of lateral movement side to side. Uh, the structures that you should be able to identify, lateral ligament, the mandible itself, and then the articular capsule. Uh, so looking at this from several different views here, uh, notice again the bones that are involved, the temporal bone and the mandible. So this would be the lateral ligament, basically connecting the zygomatic process of the temporal bone to the mandibular condyle here. This would be the articular capsule, which is just going to be your supportive connective tissue that helps to stabilize the joint. And the main movements that are allowed here are, of course, elevation and depression. So this would be an elevated um, movement here when the jaw is basically just closed. If you're not talking or consuming food, um, that would be elevation. If you open your mouth, that would be depression. So you're depressing uh, your mandible. And then there is going to be a little bit of lateral movement here as well for those side-to-side -side movements that are important for speech as well as um, chewing or masticating food. Okay, so this wraps up uh, the Chapter 9 uh, material for A&P 1. As always, please let me know if you have any questions, and thanks for listening.